Um, my name is Carrie Butch. I'm welcoming all you to EOC's third Environmental Health Summit. It's entitled COVID-19, Environmental Health, Environmental and Occupational Health and Justice. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Rutgers Center for en Environmental Exposures and Disease. COVID-19 is fundamentally an environmental and occupational disease. It's today's inaugural session. It kicks off a six part series that we hope you will continue to participate in Wednesdays at 10 through the end of October. We have a packed agenda, but before we get started, um, I want to collectively recognize all who are part of making this series happen and all of you for attending. We will, however, need to single out Maria Crescenzio for her amazing technical assistance. Please use the chat box throughout the session and later on the Q&A session. We will be recording with the caveat that if asked to delete a statement made or presentation given for any reason, we agree to do so. As somebody who has worked mainly in EJ communities, it's been really exciting to provide opportunities for academic researchers and community members to learn from each other and have a dialogue on current environmental health impact issues that impact people's lives and to take a look at them through a justice lens. COVID-19 didn't just expose the cracks in our foundation, it unearthed major structural inequities based on race and income that led to a greater chance of some people getting sick and dying. It's heartening to think that in talking and learning from each other and taking action, we will change that. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Gottschfeld, the instigator of the session. Dr. Gottschfeld is both a medical doctor and a philosophical doctor. He is a professor emeritus at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson. Okay, sorry. He's professor emeritus at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Rutgers School of Public Health and EOC. Always a pleasure to work with. He's highly regarded and well loved within Rutgers and without. His accomplishments are way too many to name, but my favorite is his distinct honor of having the library named after him on the second floor of EOC. It's great. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Gottschfeld. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I too want to uh, extend uh, my welcome to everybody for participating. It's very gratifying to see so many people uh, <clears throat> interested in this topic. So I see COVID as a challenge, but, but also a lesson in occupational and environmental health and justice. COVID exploded out of China at the beginning of 2020, meeting a totally unprepared world. Infection control experts like the CDC, gutted by politics, were not up to the task, contributing stubborn misunderstanding to willful disinformation. Beyond CDC, misinformation spread on the wings of news reports of pre-publication press releases explained by self-styled experts revealing false promises of vaccines and treatment breakthroughs just around the corner. Today, the New York Times has an article explaining why we may never get a life-saving vaccine because of their rush to market. The vaccine trials are poorly designed and short-sighted. <clears throat> That's really very distressing. You don't really know who to trust anymore. And trust in science has been completely undermined by the retractions of article after article. Over this weekend, after months of urging from our community, occupational health and safety, CDC reluctantly acknowledged that COVID spreads, at least in part, by aerosols, micro droplets that remain suspended indoors. And then a day later, without a hint of embarrassment, CDC retracted that bit of wisdom. A week earlier, CDC had published and then retracted testing guidelines. Who are we to respect and trust? I think we have to trust our profession, occupational health and safety, and our, all of our cognate uh, disciplines. For many, not just healthcare workers, COVID is an occupational disease. It's impacted workers in all walks of life. 
telecommuters got off relatively easy. Essential workers, disproportionately people of color, not so easily. And so many lost jobs altogether, losing health insurance along the way. This was all about occupational safety and health, industrial hygiene, exposure assessment, and certainly environmental justice. Healthcare workers on the front line were at very high risk of disease and death. About a thousand have died in the US. We don't really know the numbers. The health workforces were gutted by disease and mandatory self-quarantine, not to mention the unspeakable equipment shortages. <clears throat> Raj Julius will, will talk to that. So um, advanced warning allowed speculators to buy up N95 masks, ventilators, and everything else. <clears throat> and then the uh, CDC had to lie to us that masks weren't helpful in order to preserve their precious supply. So um, I think most important of all has been trying to pin down the modes of transmission. That's what industrial hygienists do, anticipation, evaluation, measurement, control. It required field research, not just modeling. And we had to learn that it's not coughs and sneezes alone. Just telling sick people to stay home was not enough. So how to keep healthcare workers safe, how to keep teachers safe, how to keep our food supply lines from farm field to grocery safe. Each link requires the experience and talents of a committed and prepared occupational safety and health workforce. So whereas people at large talk about defeating the virus, we see this as an arena for prevention. We believe in a hierarchy of controls and engineering controls must be in place. Ventilation and filtration indoors before you allow crowds. We believe in layered prevention, not just a mask, not just a distance, not just a shutdown. You can't prevent the spread of the virus if you don't believe in how the virus spreads. And that, that failure is truly tragic. You'll hear more about this from Rob. But thanks to all the EOHSI and WEC team that have put this together. And uh, I'm looking forward to this and to the subsequent meetings. So thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to Rob Lumbach. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> and uh, good morning, everyone. Let me just get my slides teed up here. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, in this uh, in this webinar series, uh, we're going to focus on the role of environments in COVID-19 risks. Uh, as Mike said, uh, COVID-19 has brought our attention to how environments we live in play such an important role in individual and community health. We're going to talk about environments with a little e. Uh, so we're going to talk about environments that are everyday environments, the environments that we live in, that we work in, that we play in, that we pray in, and in communities in general, and how those influence the relationship between the COVID virus and people getting sick. And we're going to talk about the environment also in a broad sense of not only the, the natural environment and the built environment, but also the, the social environment, which obviously interacts with how we interact with the environment. Um, and we, we can recognize evaluating control hazards uh, if we do follow uh, established occupational environmental medicine principles. So we're gonna talk about those principles and how we can make better decisions to improve uh, health outcomes that matter to people and to remedy those disparities that we see uh, due to income and race you know, that have become really so apparent in the, uh, in the pandemic. But of course, the real value of discussions like this, you know, across sectors, uh, across different organizations, uh, across different interests is to lead to solutions and remedies for reducing risk and, and addressing the injustice. So the epidemiological triangle is a model that reminds us of the three elements that are important in determining whether an epidemic occurs. Uh, we tend to focus our attention on the agent which is the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the host, uh, the susceptible individual who may get infected. So when it comes to the agent, you know, we're concerned about 
inherent properties of the virus, like how effective it is, how likely it is that people who are exposed get infected, uh, pathogenicity, how likely they get sick, because not all, all people get sick uh, with COVID-19 who are infected, and then the virulence, how severe the infection is. And we see like a wide range of, of virulence with this infection from, from asymptomatic people to, to, to serious illness and death. Some of those factors that determine, though, of course, whether or not people have a serious illness are host factors, inherent things about people such as age, uh, sex, you know, being male, it's higher risk, being older, obviously. And then also other uh, health uh, status um, property uh, characteristics such as uh, other diseases. So higher risk with uh, diabetes, uh, having a history of cancer, heart disease, obesity. And then we're sure that there are genes that are important. We don't know what they are at the, at the moment, but there are other host factors. But I put the environment at the top of this triangle. Uh, usually it's not at the top uh, to emphasize its importance. And I think it really is so important uh, in COVID-19. So when we talk about the environment, again, we're talking about those sort of everyday environment factors uh, that influence the relationship between the virus and people getting sick. So local prevalence of the infection is very important. Uh, how likely you are to be near people who are infected, how much time you spend near people who are infected, uh, whether you're in small, closed, indoor spaces, whether there's crowding, whether at home or at work. And then the controls that we put in place are environmental controls. So face coverings, respirators, physical barriers, ventilation, hand washing, disinfection of surfaces. And then again, we want to also include you know, the social and economic determinants of risk, including race, poverty, social position, the type of work that people do. And then also there are other environmental stressors, you know, besides the, the immediate environmental stressors at work, such as smoking, air pollution, poor, poor diet, lack of physical activity, psychosocial stress, uh, the built environment uh, that includes not only our homes and workplaces, but also the transportation environments. And all of this culminates in environmental justice or the disproportionate burdens of harms and also disproportionate uh, lack of environmental goods and services that some communities face. And that this leads then to uh, affecting the host in terms of comorbidities, in terms of some of those um, risk factors that we talked about in terms of diseases that people have that make them more susceptible. So today we're going to uh, focus on frontline workers who provided essential services during the epidemic and were thrust into very hazardous conditions. And these workers include healthcare workers, grocery and retail workers, food industry workers, teachers, and transportation. Uh, and they share in common that they all have relatively close contact with people who may be infected. Uh, today we're going to hear from representatives of healthcare workers, food and agriculture workers, and, and public uh, school workers. So I think it's, it's fairly obvious that uh, healthcare workers are at, increased, are, are at increased risk from COVID-19 because they work closely with patients who are known to be infected or are likely to be infected. And healthcare workers often also are in very intimate physical contact with patients and they spend time being close to patients. And on top of that, they're also potentially exposed to aerosol generating procedures, uh, which are medical procedures that can produce tiny droplets of, of airway lining fluid or saliva that are potentially infected and that can expose healthcare workers. And then of course, you know, working long hours under the epidemic, uh, during the epidemic, under conditions, very hard conditions leading to physical and psychological stress uh, may also have made healthcare workers more vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, Emily Barrett next is gonna tell us some of the results about from the uh, healthcare worker study at Rutgers. But just a little bit about some of these aerosol generating procedures. Um, you know, people who are sick with COVID-19 often need respiratory support and that involves uh, intubation, uh, involves non-invasive uh, airway um, 
positive pressure ventilation, which can then, as you know, air moves quickly along mucous membranes and along the lining of the respiratory tract, small droplets can be formed, and those can get into the air uh, and then expose workers. And then other uh, procedures like sputum induction actually induce cough, uh, bronchoscopy, also putting a tube uh, down into the uh, airways can produce these aerosols as well. And then we're all potentially exposed to droplets and aerosol particles that are produced by sneezing, coughing, singing, talking, and breathing. So here's an image uh, from the CDC of you know, someone uh, sneezing, uh, showing these larger droplets that are already immediately after the sneeze starting to fall out. They're like projectiles uh, that are uh, emitted at high velocity and then slow down quickly and then fall out. You can see those. But then there's this, this misty cloud here uh, that is a smaller aerosol that it, composed of individual particles that really can't be seen uh, individually. They're so small. And those particles can float in the air for minutes to hours. And that's the source of some of the recent concern about aerosols that you may have heard about. Uh, so, uh, you know, when a uh, person sneezes, coughs, breathes, sings, uh, we, th we believe that there are droplets, larger droplets, represented here by larger uh, circles, uh, and then also smaller aerosols that are produced. The large ones drop out within, typically within three feet. Uh, and this image from an early publication about the potential for aerosols um, indicates how potentially with an airstream, these smaller particles uh, can stay suspended and potentially uh, expose someone on the other side of the room, you know, well beyond like the six feet uh, limit that the, um, that the CDC and others are advocating. So this is possible. I think it's probably unlikely in most circumstances, and we talk about some of the reasons for that, but it's probably more like this in most cases where uh, there's a concentration of both the droplets and the smaller aerosol particles uh, close to the, uh, the source. Uh, and then through random air currents, through diffusion, uh, the smaller droplets can stay in the air, but they will attenuate over a distance. And so someone who's at a distance is less, less likely to get uh, an exposure that may cause them to be infected. But key things that we don't know here are what, what it takes to get infected, how much you have to be exposed to to get a, a infected, uh, and then also conditions typical in a room or how much of these aerosols or droplets are actually generated by people under different circumstances. Uh, but we do think that you know, staying away beyond six feet distance reduces your exposure both to the larger droplets as well as the smaller aerosols. But there is concern that um, these smaller aerosols can build up uh, in crowded or poorly ventilated uh, rooms and build up potentially to become infectious uh, to people in the room. And there's some evidence of this happening uh, in a church in uh, Washington State, in a restaurant in Korea, but, but really relatively few cases. And most of you know, what we know from evidence is that it takes close personal contact uh, to get infected with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so there are things we can do though to reduce our risk of infection. Uh, and those are the standard industrial hygiene hierarchy of controls, we can put them into this framework, uh, which allows us to you know, assess how uh, some are more effective than others, some are preferable to others. So the most preferable, the most effective approach is to eliminate, eliminate the exposure, eliminate people, uh, eliminate contact with people who are potentially infectious. So reducing community spread, isolating infected people, reducing density in workplaces and schools, uh, screening uh, and testing people. Substitution with a less hazardous uh, uh, material or substance is obviously not really applicable here. But engineering controls, which actually include you know, face coverings on people as source control. So preventing other people from being infected if you're infected. Other physical barriers, ventilation, outdoor facilities. And then administrative controls are work practices like physical distancing, work at home, uh, staggered schedules, uh, and so forth are important, obviously. And then face coverings uh, as potentially personal protective equipment 
Although they're not nearly as effective and reliable as respirators, they do provide some protection under low-risk circumstances. But for high-risk circumstances, obviously, uh, respirators uh, and then gloves were appropriate. You know, and this is, in, in the case of COVID-19, all, all of these different layers of protection are important. Uh, and this uh, figure here uh, sort of illustrates that. It illustrates the multi-barrier approach to reducing uh, risk uh, of uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2. So here it's a, you know, really an illustrative model that, um, you know, we know that none of the um, methods that are available currently to reduce risk are 100% effective. The only 100% effective way to avoid exposure is to isolate yourself from contact with other people and not share indoor spaces at all with other people. Uh, so this is, again, for illustrative purposes, assuming that each of these different types of controls which are recommended, uh, wearing face masks, staying away more than six feet, avoiding crowds, washing hands, has only a 50% uh, reduction in risk. But the cumulative effects of these, assuming that they're independent, can reduce risk by 97%. So it's important to follow those sorts of uh, methods that we have to reduce a risk. Um, but there's a lot that we don't know. So some of the important things that we don't know, again, include, you know, in many cases, under many circumstances, who's infected. Um, and then we don't know how much virus people produce uh, when they are infected uh, or how much virus it takes to get infected. So it's very hard to know and evaluate the risk and to then to assess uh, controls. Uh, so it's, we don't know how likely it is that aerosols are important under different source and environmental conditions. Again, it's possible, and there's some evidence that it actually has occurred, that aerosols have infected people. Um, and then how much indoor air ventilation is sufficient, again, to control uh, aerosol uh, uh, under various circumstances, which vary um, enormously. There's a myriad of circumstances with different numbers of people, different sized rooms, different levels of ventilation. Uh, so we so we do know a lot about uh, pr reducing risk, um, and the question really is, you know, will we use the knowledge that we have uh, to protect people and improve health outcomes? And I think that's, you know, that's not a scientific question, but more a social and political question, which I'm sure we'll have more discussion about. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the uh, slides over to Emily Barrett. Uh, Kerry, were you going to introduce Emily, or should I? Okay, so I'll go ahead. So Emily, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. So it looks like I was muted there. <laughs> you, were you introduced, Emily? Rob, why don't you go ahead and introduce Emily? Sure, sure. Yeah, I thought I was, but apparently I got muted. <laughs> All right, so, um, so Emily Barrett is a epidemiologist uh, at the School of Public Health. Uh, her work focuses on how environmental exposures, particularly chemical exposures, and especially exposures early in life uh, affect health. And then also the, the combination of uh, physical and chemical environmental exposures and social factors and psychological factors. Um, and she's been one of the principal investigators on the Rutgers Healthcare Worker Study. Um, and she's gonna tell us a bit more about that. So thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, if someone could allow me to share my screen, that would be great.
Maria, are you able to? Okay, perfect. So I just did. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see my screen now. So I'll be talking to you today about the work that we've been doing in hospital workers to learn more about COVID-19 over the last six months. So I know March feels like a million years ago now, but if we think back, it was clear from the very start that healthcare workers were going to be a critical group in the COVID-19 fight. So we heard reports coming out of China about thousands of healthcare workers being infected with the virus. We saw that in Italy, 20% of the responding healthcare workers became infected. And we saw this onslaught coming towards us in the US with um, a feeling of uh, uncertainty about how we would handle it. And it became clear as we watched the pandemic um, hit New York City first that we were really ill-equipped to deal with it. So there were these horrifying photos of healthcare workers in New York City hospitals who were forced to wear garbage bags or ponchos to try to protect themselves because of insufficient PPE. We heard stories about physical and mental exhaustion, about psychological trauma, and of course, this heightened infection risk. And as you all know, we lived through this. New Jersey quickly emerged as a COVID-19 hotspot. So March 4th was our first confirmed positive COVID-19 case in New Jersey. And just a few days later, one of my colleagues, Marty Blazer, who's um, in the top right of the panel here, was very prescient and he gathered a group of us and said, we really need to get ahead of this and to start working on it right away because it's gonna hit New Jersey hard and we need to be prepared. And so we spent basically every night for the next few weeks on these Zoom calls to try to figure out how we were gonna address this issue. And within two weeks, we were recruiting for a new study called the Rutgers Corona Cohort. So what we wanted to do was um, put together a cohort that would allow us to characterize factors related to transmission of the virus and disease severity within our healthcare system. And for those of you who um, don't work on research, a two week turnaround time from the inception of an idea to recruitment is pretty much unprecedented. So that included designing a study, building a team, getting funding for the study, developing a protocol, IRB approval, building databases. This was really a Herculean effort um, and I've never been part of something like this before. It was really um, pretty unique. So we actually, our, um, our rapid uh, implementation, um, the way we were able to go into the field so quickly was really fortuitous because we were able to schedule our visits just as cases were rising in New Jersey. So the blue line shows COVID-19 cases at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and the red line shows them at University Hospital Newark. And you see there was this really steep rise across the course of late March to early April, and that's when we were um, bringing our participants in. So we were really interested in healthcare workers. So we recruited 291 um, medical staff at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. So these are folks who have direct patient contact. We also had 255 um, medical staff from University Hospital in Newark. And then to compare them to um, a population that didn't have direct patient contact, we recruited 176 Rutgers employees. These visits included a throat swab to test for virus, a blood test to test for antibodies, saliva for future research, and a questionnaire. And I'll just share a couple of results from that study with you. So the most dramatic one, and even if you have never done any biostats in your life, it should jump right out, is that we had 41 people who tested positive for the virus. And of those, 40 of them were healthcare workers. Only one was a non-healthcare worker. So this is a truly huge difference between the two groups and tells us that our healthcare workers are at risk. Another thing to point out is um, we looked at differences between the two hospitals. So, and it was really interesting. So at University Hospital, nearly 12% of our participants tested positive where it was only about 3.5% at Robert Wood Johnson. So there was definitely a geographic difference here. We also noted that nurses seem to be um, most highly vulnerable. So in this case, we had nearly 20% of nurses at University Hospital Newark testing positive, a lower number at um, Robert Wood Johnson, but still in both hospitals, they tested positive at a higher rate than um, the physicians or residents or other groups. 
We also saw differences by units. So emergency room workers, as you might imagine, seem to be more vulnerable. Um, we also saw lots of cases in the OR in designated COVID-19 units, as you might expect. So this was a relatively small study, but it had a couple of immediate impacts. The first thing was that university hospitals saw these results and adopted a masking policy. So prior to this, they did not require masks in the hospital. The second thing was that Robert Wood Johnson decided that they would um, follow up on this to uh, implement a voluntary screening of all employees. And that's what we call the Robert Wood Johnson screening study. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about that now. So this was offered to all employees, whether you had patient contact or not. It's about 5,500 5, employees at the hospital and we managed to test almost 4,000 of them. Anyone was eligible as long as they were healthy. If you had clear, um, a clear signal that you were sick with COVID-19, you got um, testing through um, another means, not our study. So one of the differences between this and the Rutgers Corona cohort that I told you about before is that our testing here really occurred at the tail end of the virus in New Jersey of that first wave. Um, and as a result, the good news is we only actually found out of about 4,000 people, 13 were virus positive but another 374 were antibody positive, meaning that they had been previously infected with the virus. So overall, we had about 10% of people who tested virus or antibody positive. And the first thing we wanted to do was to look at whether we saw these signals of differences by hospital role again. So this plot tells you the proportion of people in any given job role who were tested and tested positive. So for instance, you'll see phlebotomists up at the top there. We had 47 phlebotomists in the study and nearly 25% of them tested positive for virus or antibodies. Um, other groups that seemed to be disproportionately affected were dining and food services, maintenance and housekeeping, security and support, and then some nursing roles. What other factors predicted a positive test? Black or Hispanic ethnicity. So participants who were Black or Hispanic were twice as likely to test positive for virus or antibodies. Younger participants actually were also more likely, um, and that might be due to behaviors. Um, and then folks who had more direct patient care were more likely to test positive. And these were models that were adjusted for um, potential confounders. So we don't know for sure whether these infections occurred in the hospital. They could also be um, signs of community spread. But what I do think this tells us is that we need to protect all hospital employees, not just the frontline workers. So um, just two next steps for where we're going with this. One is that we are hoping to continue follow-up of um, all of the participants in these studies to learn more about um, the course of the virus um, additional risk for infection as we hit um, waves during this winter of the virus, um, whether we have persistent immunity among those who have been infected. And then a second um, direction that we're going in is building on these observations about disparities. And so we're planning a project called MJ Heroes 2, which is community engaged research to improve COVID-19 testing in hard to reach populations in Essex, Union, Passaic, and Middlesex counties. And the idea is that we would capitalize on these healthcare worker ambassadors um, in our health system to disseminate um, testing opportunities to their friends, families, neighbors, et cetera. So lastly, I'm just gonna thank the huge team that made this work possible. There are dozens of people who have been involved in these studies and including many people on the call. Um, to thank our dedicated participants who have really been champions of these projects and our funders. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Mike, did you want to introduce? Yes. Rosalind? Thank okay, thank you. So I'm pleased to introduce Rosalind Julius. I'm an advanced practice nurse with the Rutgers Employee Health Service, and she's going to talk to us about it, her experience protecting healthcare workers in crisis. So, Roz, if you're unmuted, you're ready. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, that's Dr. Gottschall said. My name is Rosalind, and I'm the employee health nurse working in uh, Rutgers Health, located in the clinical academic building. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just want to go with my COVID experience. 
and I must say it it's still uh, still very enlightening. In my many years of nursing, nothing has brought the greatest challenge in the shortest period of time as this coronavirus from mid March to present. Its impact on the healthcare community went from zero to one to one hundred. It seemed overnight. I remember leaving work on a Friday evening, just having responded to calls from our healthcare workers who were out of the country, hearing about a travel ban and quarantining for 14 days upon their return to phone messages reporting symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Upon returning to work that following Monday, it seemed like a dam had broke. There were so many voice messages and calls were coming in constantly throughout the day. At the time, employee health was made manned by only three employees, so being overwhelmed was an understatement. Under the direction of Dr. Shereen Hastings, medical director, it took only a few minutes to recruit other faculty physicians, health staff, and other employees from the Department of Medicine to lend a hand. The entire Rutgers community seemed to heed the call and just wanted to help in one way or another. In responding to the many calls of employees reporting symptoms, I remember thinking to myself, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to make sure everyone got the help that they needed? But seeing how professional, timely, and caring everyone was in responding to the calls, I felt assured that we were doing the best we could under the circumstances. We quickly developed a triage method that got calls to the right staff provider where it was determined whether quarantining, isolating, or scheduling for testing would be done. Getting people tested was very troubling at first because things had to be coordinated with the hospital's infection prevention team, and they were testing their own people as well. We quickly had a surplus room turned into a test site and immediately began testing employees via nasal pharyngeal swab. When the call came for personal protective equipment, of course, our supply wasn't nowhere where we would have liked it to be. Who could imagine this thing was going to happen to us? Getting the healthcare workers fit tested for N95 respirator presented another challenge. And again, help came from within the departments of the university. This time, Rutgers Environmental Health Services and the Dean of Clinical Affairs, Dr. Vicki Craig, uh, presented themselves very well. Supplies were then pulled to one central location and the distribution was to the highest priority areas. As the weeks rolled by, the demand for N95 was in very, very short supply, especially for the smaller size respirators. We had to fit test people over and over again because as one brand was depleted, another was obtained. So retesting had to be done to make sure that our employees had the right protection that they needed to work on the front line. And I must also mention that the hospital also provided fit testing for our employees as well. During the height of the pandemic, I had concerns about the safety of our healthcare workers and not being able to provide them with the supply of protection they needed. I felt an obligation to always be available when someone called for services or to report a symptom. I didn't want a call missed, not return, or I didn't turn anyone away. I was not a frontline worker, or I didn't consider myself a frontline worker. I didn't personally see any uh, severely ill patient. I did not see the faces of patients in distress, but I did hear some of the stories from our true frontline workers as they came in to get fit tested. They were telling their stories of patient suffering. They were telling me about their own fatigue and just hearing how they felt emotionally was pretty troubling for me. I would often ask them how they were doing because I felt the least I could do was hear them and be available for them. Thinking back though, given that we were testing very symptomatic employees, I cannot remember anyone ever voicing a concern about getting COVID or just backing out of the testing procedure itself. This experience truly has been enlightening to me but I think we learned a lot from it and we will be better prepared come a surge if there is one. Thank you. 
Thank you, Raj, for that personal reflection on a terrible time. Uh, I can imagine, you know, a doctor in an ICU, if they lose one patient, it's a terrible tragedy. It's hard to imagine them losing patient after patient, day after day. So it's now time to turn this over uh, for the panel to <coughs> Deborah Coyle McFadden from the New Jersey Work Environment Council. Uh, and we've been fortunate to be able to partner with WEC on a number of occasions, and this is an exciting opportunity for us. So, Deborah, the panel is yours. Thank you, Dr. Gotchwell. Let me just say the, the excitement is all ours. We're really, you know, thrilled to be here today. And Roz, I'm hoping that you can stick, or stick around for the panel as well, because um, we're going to have an opportunity to have more of a dialogue and really want to thank you for sharing that powerful story. Um, so my name is Deborah Coyle McFadden. I'm the Executive Director of New Jersey Work Environment Council, and we're a coalition of 70 labor, community, environmental organizations. We work on issues that are really at the intersection of the labor movement, environmental movement. Um, and we are also part of the National Council for Occupational Safety and Health Network. Um, so, you know, from day one, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about the work that WEC has been doing. Uh, you know, from day one, we were working to sound the alarm about improving safety and health protocols in the workplace. Um, some of the work that we've done is include, we have co-authored two reports, one, COVID versus schools, which was a national release with our partners at the Healthy Schools Network. And it contained recommendations on actions schools should be taking before reopening. Um, and then the other report that we co-authored, a roadmap for a just green recovery here in New Jersey, and include recommendations on how we protect workers and also how we rebuild our economy in a more equitable way um, and also bringing in the um, renewable energy piece. We really need to start looking at at, um, you know, creating this green economy. Um, so with that, we've also, we've done some advocacy work for strong whistleblower protections, right to refuse, expanding paid family leave. But I think some of the work that, you know, I'm most proud that we've been able to do is build a, a community. Um, we've also part partnered with Rutgers Learn and Jersey Renews, and we do a weekly web series, Saving Lives, Protecting Workers. Um, it's every Tuesday at 10, and in this series, we talk about public health, we talk with public health experts, government officials, uh, medical personnel, and frontline workers as well um, about the latest developments uh, in COVID, about COVID. Um, so I just wanted to give a little, little background of what we've done, and Dr. Gottschfeld, I couldn't also agree more with your comments about the CDC and I just want to put this for the framing for the panel. Um, you know, this past weekend, I don't know if people saw this or read about it after the fact, but CDC finally acknowledged um, that can be transmitted um, aerosol. Um, and then just like that, it was taken down off the CDC um, website and a message was there that said, you know, basically, sorry, this was a draft version. We're looking at proposing some of these changes and making recommendations, but we put this up in error. Um, in addition, I'd say also, you know, the one other agency I want to mention, and I want to talk to the panel about this as well, is, you know, the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration that oversees um, that oversees workplaces. Um, from the get-go, they've been missing in action and even going as far as to refuse to issue uh, an emergency standard for infectious disease for healthcare workers. And we know that the work was done for the standard or groundwork, I should say, had been laid for the standard in the prior administration. So there certainly has been a lack of leadership. But I really want to get into these issues now with my panel. So I'm going to ask my panelists if if you would please um, introduce yourselves, just say a few words about your organization and the workforce that you represent. And I'm going to start with Sue Butterfield. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Butterfield. I'm the president of the State County Education Associations, and we represent 11,000 uh, education professionals throughout the county, and that would include our teachers, our instructional assistants, our bus drivers, our secretaries, uh, custodians, guidance counselors. You know, we have a wide range of members in our association. And uh, so, as you can imagine, you know, um, many issues as far as or impact of the of the issues as we've been dealing with the pandemic. And I'm grateful to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Kelly? Sure. And good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Kelly. I work as the general coordinator for CAPA, the Farm Worker Support Committee. We're a membership organization of farm workers and low wage immigrant workers throughout southern New Jersey. And we also do work over in southeastern Pennsylvania and the Delmarva Peninsula. But so most of our folks have been uh, doing essential work during this pandemic um, in farms, packing houses, food processing, um, and um, folks also some in construction and landscaping. So glad to be here with you this morning. Thank you. Matthew Kane. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matty Kane. I'm a business agent for the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 152, down here in South Jersey. Uh, the long and short of it is we represent about 17,000 workers in the region. And until March, we didn't know that everyone we represented was considered a frontline or essential worker because we have food manufacturing, healthcare, public sector, and of course, retail, your shop rights and acnes. So, we, we, we got a rude awakening in March <laughs> as to what our, what our station was in the world. I, I think that, I think we all did. Um, and, and Trino Sordo. Trina, if you're speaking, I'm not able to hear you. Maria, can you confirm that Trina um, is able to unmute? I don't see her as a panelist now. She probably disconnected. Let me see. Oh. Okay, so um, if, if she uh, if she comes back on, can somebody just kind of jump in and let me know? Because I certainly want to introduce Trina as well. Um, and then also again, Rosalind Julius um, is going to be part of this panel who who just spoke um, about her experience, a nurse practitioner at Rutgers Health. So I kind of want to want to start with a board, just kind of a broad question with. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go down the panel as well, just to give a brief description. Um, you know, at the height of the pandemic, you know, what was happening, what was the worker experience, and how has it changed, and is it any is it any different uh, is any different now as we're 28 weeks into the pandemic. Like what, what's happening now in the workplaces versus what was happening then? And Maddie, I'm gonna kind of start, I wanna start with you because you kind of referenced this, you know, right right up top in your opening remarks. It was just, you know, some, some can, uh, chaos and confusion and we were caught off guard. Correct, and and I would say in the first month or two, you know, uh, it, it took those 30 to 60 days to become the new normal and everyone adjusted in the workplace. But I, I'd like to almost fast forward to Right now, today, the issues we're facing, which are uh, number one, the health care exemptions and all the laws <laughs> that exclude health care workers from standard labor practices. We understand that health care is an essential commodity in the, work, in the workforce and needs different regulations. However, things like people had to use their own PTO time for self quarantine. There, there, there was no provision allowed for that. So people are burning all their vacation time. And it references back to what Rob spoke about earlier, the overwork and stress factors involved with this. You know, we're all through the PPE parts and all the things we've had to do to adjust and get back to, you know, business as usual, which which it'll never be, but we're, we're getting as close to it as we can. But at the same time, I have, you know, we represent the... Uh, we have 23 healthcare facilities, and I would say in all 23 of them right now, I have people who can't take time off because they have no PTO time left because they burned it all off for daycare reasons, you know. And that's another one, you know. The you know schools reopening, 
We have people that can't go to work because they have to take care of their kids. They can't get them into daycare. You know, there's there's so many extenuating factors that aren't covered under any provision of the law for this. And even FMLA doesn't even, you know, allow for certain exemptions. So thank you, Matt. I'm actually going to, because we really don't have a lot of time, and I think that was a good overview. And I see Trina um, has now been able to get on. So hi, Trina. Thank you for being with us this morning. I know there's been some technical difficulties. Um, if, maybe, uh, maybe if you could introduce yourself, and, and maybe I don't know if you caught the tail end of Maddie's comments, but he was talking about the challenges um, uh, for workers with daycare, and maybe you can talk about the challenges as well for daycare sure. workers. I did. Thank you. And thank you all for being patient. Uh, so my name is Trina Scordo. I'm the executive director of New Jersey Communities United. We work in a very close partnership, labor community partnership with CWA Local 1037, organizing early child, uh, early childhood educators and workers. Um, we've had this partnership since 2012, so I know we're short on time. So I'm going to uh, just talk a bit about the two different groups of workers. There's in-home daycare workers who take care of children in their homes, which is one special set of circumstances we have been dealing with, and then there's center workers. So going back to March, when uh, everything was shut down, in-home providers were not shut down. They continue to provide daycare for children in their communities. Um, centers were closed. So what happened was, and I just want to say in-home providers are paid through the state. Uh, so they have an interesting work relationship with the state. So they get paid through vouchers for um, child care vouchers through the state. So what happened was centers closed, in-home providers were open. They continued to provide care, um, mostly for who was working, essential workers. Um, but there were no safety guidelines. The state was a little bit slow and probably reeling a bit from what was going on. So they had their doors open, they had their own homes open, uh, and they were taking care of children that they had been taking care of, plus taking in uh, some new children from essential workers who suddenly found themselves, as you said, without <laughs> without daycare. Um, and in some cases, um, schools were closed and they had to find somehow to deal with their younger children. Um, but there were very few safety guidelines. So uh there was the regulations for how to deal with uh, in-home providers came after the fact so there were no masks there were no standards on gloves there was no standards about um uh sanitizing and you know we're talking about babies and mostly mo babies and mostly pre-k so this is how are you how are you you can't distance right you gotta hold them they need to be cared for uh so it was a unique set of circumstances um so we begin to quickly talk to uh, our members about what they felt they needed to be safe uh, and what some of the items that they needed to have access to, which were difficult to come by. We were all struggling with that. And then the state gave guidelines. So here's the thing, the state gave guidelines without any money attached to it. And we're talking about low wage workers, right? So they were like, hey, you have to have masks. Hey, you have to change your shirts every hour. Hey, you have to have separate bins for the toys. Hey, you have to have sanitation, you know, sanitizing wipes in this amount. And it was like, okay, these all make sense and we all support them, but who's paying for them? Uh, so, so Trina, really, uh, yeah. I'm going to jump in here um, because you're, you're um, I definitely want to touch on yeah, all yeah. these topics. And I think I that's really a key point that I want, mm -hmm. I want the participants um, to take away from today. Yep. Um, you know, the fact that you have low wage workers yep. and guidelines were put in place and then, okay, you have to pay for it out of your own pocket. Yes, so that, and then the only thing, and I know we're crunched on time, center workers, similar situation. Uh, the difference is that the centers are, uh, because they are having a hard time getting their hands on the supplies, they are then giving the workers very little to keep themselves safe inside the centers, right? Or to keep the children yeah. safe. So they'll yeah. get one small bottle of hand sanitizer for a full day, right? It's a problem. So these yeah. are the things we're organizing around and, and the issues that are coming up. Absolutely, and I think it goes back to what we've been saying to the beginning of this crisis as well. I mean, this, you know, occupational safety and health is, you know, public health. We're one and the same in this crisis. Yes. And Jessica, if I can maybe turn it over to you now and talk about, um, again, we're looking at kind of what happened in the beginning and what changes and where you are now um, um, with farm workers. What, 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 what's happened in, with your uh, worker population? And Jessica, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Sorry. 
goodness gracious technology. Um, I think what you said is that is like, um, is like totally right, right? It's, it was super chaotic in the beginning. Uh, everybody, we had a lot of, so when it, when it all started, ag wasn't really happening. So we didn't have, farms weren't in production too much. We had nurseries that were working and we had a lot of our folks working in packing houses and packing facilities. And there were a, a lot of people started getting sick really quickly because they, the employers weren't providing any PPE uh, folks. There was no physical distancing. There was no uh, like uh, staggering of shifts. Um, they weren't doing any notification of people like when people were getting sick. So like people were working with people sick next to them uh, were then getting sick, weren't getting paid for the time that they had to take off. Uh, so the, the first month, two months, of this thing was like really chaotic, particularly for for packing house workers. They were providing their own PPE. There was no like, um, no nothing made mandatory. No enforcement of anything in the workplaces. So that's when we had like the most people getting sick and the most people getting really terribly sick and hospitalized and and whatnot and people taking it home to their families. Um, farm work started up in April. And when it started, there were no guidelines. Uh, nothing was written. The state didn't publish anything until May 20th. Uh, so most farms by then were up and in full swing, um, had their full complement of workers. Um, and we we saw early on that there were there were some farms who who were doing what they needed to do, right? Like who were doing physical distancing, who were providing masks. Um, the health department was doing was was providing some masks. There was also some coming through. Uh, some of the um, wholesale buyers were were providing some, um, and then but it was really patchworky. So you'd find places that had really done a lot to protect their workers and had looked at had taken the time. Like New Jersey hadn't published anything, but but there was some stuff out nationally, and there were some guidelines published by some growers associations, and who had really taken the time to figure out what do we need to do to protect our workforce. And then there were other employers who had absolutely done nothing. And our uh, we started doing outreach um, to farm workers in May uh, on the earlier side of most folks doing in-person outreach. And we struggled a lot with that to determine, like, is this right? Is it safe for our staff and, and folks going out to do these visits? But we knew that like our farm worker population just isn't getting information from anybody else except the employers. Um, and the clinics at that point in time still weren't going out. No other agencies were going out. The Department of Labor still isn't going out to do outreach. Um, they're all doing it all virtually, um, which just really limits the information getting out to our community. Um, so we started going out in May, and we've we found that even to this day that it's still really patchworky is, is what it comes down to. Like some of the places that were super chaotic in the beginning have gotten their stuff together uh, and are, are doing what they need to do. But there are employers who are just always going to be the ones who hold out and who don't do anything, <laughs> who don't who don't care about their workers, to, to say it that way. Um, and so we're really looking at um, the state really trying to like lift up sometimes and, and showcase the employers who are doing the right thing, but then not wanting to put in place any mandated guidelines because we still don't have any mandated guidelines for farms. Nothing is mandated. I think that's a really important point right there with the mandated guidelines. You have employers, you know, as you said, will do the right thing. The guidelines are really, and why they need to be mandatory is because they make that even playing field, right? So, it, you know, by not having mandated guidelines, you know, basically employers, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, you know, are allowed to get away with this because they're not mandated to do it. And, I, you know, the other, the other point that you brought up, you know, with, you know, in the beginning going to work with no guidelines, um, and the number of workers that got sick. So again, you're looking at, you know, low wage workers that have now, you know, contracted this. It's very difficult to prove that you've attract you um, contracted it on, on the job, right? Um, and so now being stuck in addition to losing time from work because you're sick, um, also now being stuck with medical bills. 
So, so this actually, I want to uh, jump over to Sue Butterfield. I know, you know, certainly the school environment has been on the minds of a lot of people, certainly multiple articles a day. Um, you know, we're now for New Jersey, we're a couple weeks in and just wanted to, you know, hear from you, you know, what are, what's your experience? What are you hearing from as schools are opening? And, I, and one other question I would add to that, um, because I do know some schools are in person. Right. Um, how, how are the students? Um, I mean, what's this a worker panel? But how, how, what's this? What are you hearing from the student reaction as well? So I'll start with in terms of the opening. Um, I'm going to use Jessica's word patchworky. Uh, you know, there aren't every district submits their own plan, and it is the absolute wild west. Uh, and and so. In terms of the protection for workers, that's one thing, but also, you know, we have members that are parents. So you may work in a district that is in person five days a week. There are districts that have half days, five days a week. And then you may your your own children may be in a district that's fully remote. So it is it is a it's an incredibly challenging situation, uh, you know, as far as that goes. Um, in addition, you know, the the protections are again in some districts extremely lacking. Uh, you know, we don't have, for example, we have started to Oprah um, maintenance schedules and we're finding that bathrooms are being cleaned once a day in buildings with hundreds of students and even educators or there's no meat. They may have um, purchased the filters, but there's no plan to replace the filters. So there's a there's a lack uh, in some dish. And again, it, some districts are are pretty good and others are absolutely awful. It's it's a wide range there. Um, as far as students, I have a 17 year old senior um, and, and uh, you know, some of the other anecdotes that uh, that I'm hearing, but. You know, it's even when I'm grateful that I don't have a young child and I'm working, but but even it, there's a lot of challenges with, you know, uh, the remote norms, right? As far as education, um, we are hearing more and more, you know, one that got news was in Patterson, the 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 Zoom bombings that, um, you know, there were there was um, profane language and there was actually, you know, they're being they're pursuing criminal activity um, in terms of the students who were, you know, putting out pornographic material on the Zooms. Uh, another educator reported that that a parent totally naked um, got onto a Zoom call in, in full view of the of the students. And this was a young class. This was like a kindergarten class. So, uh, you know, there's that's not in terms of the physical safety, but we have emotional safety issues with with our our students. Um, so like it's just really all over the place in terms of the buildings some of which are 100 years old and actually some of those are better because you can open those windows um but when you open the windows we have reports of animals coming in and bees you know for those that are in class so it's it's there's a lot of impact that uh you know the little things i guess that that are putting folks at risk. Um, but also I was very, I just have to say when Dr. Lamba talked about small, you know, five out of those eight environmental factors, I feel like that he mentioned are things that schools are facing. You know, teachers are with students for hours at a time and there is not a physical barrier. You know, um, there's uh, crowding. How do you do fire drills? How do you do? We're not worried about school shooters anymore. I guess we're not going to do lockdown drills where we go into the corner. Uh, you know, so it's there's just the impact of all of this uh, is felt in a lot of different ways and, and has yet to be fully fleshed out and dealt with.
Deborah, I think and then I have, I have students on, on, on virtual, I'm pointing to my computer. So, so having to make that adjustment, it, it's not the, the norm. And I hear it's, it's almost more challenging if you only have a few, I mean, what I've heard is you have a ch few children in your class because tendency is if most of the classroom is on the computer, you're almost more focused and it's a, it's a real challenge and an adjustment. Um, and, you know, I just have to say, you know, uh, uh, for my, my son's school, uh, he's in kindergarten, you know, they're, they're, they're really working hard. Um, and I think they're doing a phenomenal job, all things considered. One question I kind of wanted to uh, first start with um, Roz and Maddie just quickly is just kind of to keep an eye on the time here as well. Um, since, since you both work in the healthcare sector, Certainly, as you both referenced early on, supply chain of PPE was a problem. We even had issues with, you know, quote unquote, you know, fake PPE masks coming in from China that were supposed to be um, N95 masks that were not. Um, what is the status now? Um, you know, what what is the access to supplies, and how are employers in the healthcare industry? What what is being done looking forward to the uh, later in the fall? as you know we're potentially looking at another surge and perhaps let me start with you uh, as far as um, uh, n95 respirators that's been our biggest challenge and it still remains a challenge especially for the smaller sizes you know we have a big concern but we have someone uh, who's tirelessly working on getting respirators my biggest concern is as we are getting respirators we're getting respirators of different brands so that means for each brand of respirator, we have to fit test. So if we have five brands of respirators, once one is depleted, we have to fit test on the next brand that goes out. So that's the biggest concern right now. But we have our Mindy who's working tirelessly and always, always uh, sending me an email or a text saying, I can get this particular respirator, what do you think? And when she mentions something in small, I always tell her to jump on it because that's been our biggest uh, supply shortage as far as N95s. Um, we still have an issue with getting N95s, but again, the smaller sizes has been the greatest issue for us. And just to mention, and I should have mentioned it earlier, we've had a few departments like the emergency medicine, anesthesiology, who actually went out and purchased elastomeric respirators for their employees. So again, they had to be fit tested on these and we always make sure any respirator that comes in is a NIOSH approved respirator. Right. I mean, the fit testing, that's key. I mean, yeah, that's, very, that's very absolutely, key. absolutely key. Experience with this and the facilities you're, you're working in. I would have to knock on wood and say we, we never experienced any shortages, but what we did have was a lot of uh, rationing going on. <laughs> we seem to affect the workers more, you know, giving you one mask for a week, yeah, you know, once and that kind of stuff. So what we we like a proactive plan for that. We went into the facilities and found out who really needs the N95 in the facility. You know, let's let us let us start there. We made face masks for the non-contact people, the dietary staffs, the, you know, who aren't who aren't in direct patient care. And that, and that that seems to have curtailed a lot of the you know, a lot of the shortages that were projected. But still to this day, people are you know, yeah. daily basis. We're getting one 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 N or one K not five a week, and it's our responsibility to take care of. It. <laughs> yeah, Maddie, your sound's going in and out a little bit, but really? you know the one other thing that I heard as well, and maybe you could just speak up on this for just a couple of seconds, is like you said, the rationing of the N95s, right? Where you know some when we we've, we've talked to other workers in, in in healthcare, if they did that, you know, during the normal time, they would actually have been reprimanded for that if they weren't switching out their their face masks frequently enough. Is that is, has that been your experience, and also Roz, as you as well, have, have you have you experienced that? Yes, we actually went to a reuse or extended use model, um, in which was okayed by the CDC at the time when we had our limited use of N95s. There was also a point where we uh, sent them to the hospital to have a UV sterilization of their N95s. 
So it was a big, big problem in, in the beginning. Uh, you were told that you could only wear it once and get rid of it, but you know, you have to do what you have to do and reuse became a big thing and then extended use another thing. All right. Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I have to, I, I, can, I can follow up with that with what Rosalind just said. And the other thing is we've, we've actually instructed our workers to keep a Ziploc baggie in their locker and put your name on the your Ziploc baggie, don't wear it at home, don't leave it right where you need it. That way you're only using it in the facility or at work, you know, and that cuts down on the, oh, I left it in the car, or, you know, because that, that was the original issue was people were taking them home and they come back in, somebody go through three or four of them in a week when somebody else is using the same one to do. So I want to kind of open this up, up to the panel um, at large, this question. Um, what, what are you seeing uh, in terms of uh, employer retaliation if um, workers are, you know, having to take time off for quarantine or, you know, raising safety concerns, which I, I, hopefully people know it's a complete violation uh, against the wall. But is this something that, that you're having to, uh, you know, t to respond to? Is this, is this happening right now? Yeah, so I'm going to, I'll jump, I'm going to jump in particularly uh, with the center workers that we're organizing, unfortunately. We have seen that from one of the centers uh, that we organize. I'm gonna name the center too, it's the leaguers. Um, those workers have been demanding, I'm just gonna give an example, have been demanding a meeting with management uh, since the beginning of the summer to discuss what reopening should look like, to discuss their health and safety concerns, to define their needs because they know what they need. Um, and and mind you, there is a there's a union contract in place, so they're unionized, right? They they're represented by local 1037, uh, and management has basically uh, refused to meet. That's the bottom line. They they would say that they haven't, but they've it's basically refused to meet with them over an issue that's covered in the contract. Uh, so workers started picketing, um, and uh, doing direct action, and 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 also bringing informing the community, right? So there's obviously they know the parents in in the neighborhoods that use these centers. Uh, so we've had a number of picket lines and the response from management was to uh, send a threatening layoff notice saying uh, basically, yeah, that, that's exactly what they did. Basically saying, you know, well, if we, if we have to, if we have to take help, I'm paraphrasing, but if we have to take health and safety measures into account, including remote learning, there will be massive layoffs. Um, that's a threat that, and it happened, literally happened uh, the week that we had multiple picket lines. Um, so we're obviously continuing to fight that and file and we're filing charges with the with the labor board for what's that worth in our partnership in 1037, but something else we're looking at and this came up earlier is figuring out um, charges with OSHA for, for also for what that is worth right because workers are, are being told they have to come into the workplace, but then not given enough health and safety uh, materials and resources to keep themselves or the children that they're having to educate safe. Uh, so it is, it's unfortunate, but em, employer, in this case, the employer has, is really, um, is really coming down hard on their employees for taking action around health and safety. Uh, and we haven't just slightly different, like with in-home providers, it's a little different in part, it's because it's the state and it's the Murphy administration. So not retaliation, but I will say a, a very slow and lack of response to the demands, the health and safety demands coming from in-home providers. So I'll give an example of what we've done to address that. Um, you know, uh, like we were saying, there's a shortage of materials. One of the things that the in-home providers identified was that they could not get access to no-touch thermometers. So we have, um, we actually have uh, got a grant from Robert Wood Johnson to do organizing around distribution of no-touch thermometers. And so we're attempting to fill gaps in these, in these cases where, for whatever reason, the materials are slow to get to the in-home providers, um, we're kind of doing some mutual aid organizing where we can get resources to get those thermometers and then distribute them in the communities uh, through the in-home providers and their networks. Um, so I just, I wanted to give, there's two different, you know, there's, yeah. so there's sometimes it's retaliation and sometimes it's ridiculously slow uh, response or non-response. 
I, yeah, I, unfortunately, it's not the first time I, I've heard that as well. And that's why I think organizations like yours are so important, like nonprofits, we have to jump in and we help fill those gaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about and the other panelists? Would you like to respond to this question? Yeah, so I think we've seen all kinds of retaliation. Uh, we've, we've had people being told upfront to not take time off, <laughs> um, that if they get sick, that there is no paid time off. And so just that sort of like discouraging people from the get go. Uh, we've had people, uh, a number of our members who have been, who have tested positive and have been told by their employers to come back as, as like before the, the 14 days have, have passed and before they've gotten a negative test. So they've been telling them three days later, oh, your, your fever's down, come back to work. Um, we need you, we don't, we don't, we, we can't stay home oh, or you'll lose your job. We've had, we have one woman who was told not to come back at all because she had put her coworkers at risk. And so that was like, I believe that that was like a situation where the, the, the nursery was trying to take advantage of someone that they wanted to get rid of anyways and using the fact that she got COVID. Like, so it wasn't, I don't think it was all about COVID, but, um, and then, yeah. And then we've had a couple of, a couple of instances where, where folks have organized to request something at, on the workplace of whether it's been more social distancing or whatever, where folks have also been threatened and, and their employment, their livelihood. Yeah. And Jessica, if if they have if somebody has to take time off for quarantine, uh, is it unpaid? I mean, it should be paid, right? Like, it, it, oh, it should be paid. I'm just wondering what the experience is. Everybody's read is that it should be paid, but most of the folks that we've been talking to have not been getting paid time off, and so we've yeah. been trying to figure out like what are like how do we like really help people address that because uh, sometimes we're finding out weeks later or months later, but um. Yeah, working to like figure out how to go back to those employers now is is challenging. Yeah, I mean, that's really, uh, I know something that, you know, a lot of organizations are looking at around the state. And I know you're absolutely plugged into this, Jessica. I mean, that that is that is a real problem. And also, you know, having workers go back before they get the negative test. Um, you know, we now know um, that, you know, asymptomatic people can spread this just as easily as symptomatic people. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of wanted to, I want to move because I, I'm kind of keeping an eye on time here. Um, so I actually just kind of want to run through through the entire panel, you know, ask if you can maybe, you know, in, in 30 second wrap up, you know, just kind of talk about, you know, what is the um, uh, what is the one thing that, you know, you'd want people to take away um, from this particular panel or what is or or maybe if you'd like, you know, what what is the one thing that you would be a major ask from employers or government that would really help and benefit your members? And uh, let me let let me start with um, uh, Rosalind. Okay, what I would like to to put out there is uh, there's a big concern now with uh, the flu season coming up. I, I want to make sure everybody knows that flu vaccines are available. They should get their flu shots. They're available for all Rutgers employees. Um, this would help actually our frontline workers, our hospital workers, everyone. You know, they'll take the burden off uh, anything that coming down the pike as far as this COVID and, and flu combined. Um, my concern is just making sure everyone knows that vaccines are available come out and get them. Employee health is there. We're always there for your safety. We're always there to meet any of your concerns. If we can't do it in employee health, we can definitely direct you where you need to go to get concerned. But uh, again, my, my big thing right now for health and safety employee wise, come get your flu shot. Come get your flu shot. It's there for you. All right. Well, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have you take my my son because that's one of the the biggest fights we have here is when I have to take him to get a shot, and I get it. But he does. I will say he gets rewarded with ice cream or or taffies for for doing it. Nobody likes it, but it's so important. Um, it's so Sue, important. <laughs> it, exactly. Sue, how about how about I'm gonna move to you now. Well, you know, I'm going to paraphrase a, a terrible song from the 80s and say, stop, collaborate, and listen. You know, we 
we understand that the buildings are all different. We understand that it, it, the money's not there. We want to work with our employers. We, but you hear superintendents, you know, blaming a lack of staffing for going to remote learning when, when, you know, the, and and denying, um, you know, ADA accommodations. So I would say the and not no transparency. Um, you know, and we're opering like crazy. And why do we have to go through all this? Why can't we sit down and do the best we can and figure it out? And and that would be what you know, because every situation is different, and we've been put in this position of every school has a different plan. So I would say that's what we need the most. Thank you, Sue. And I know that the plans are submitted uh, to the Department of Education, um, but you know, how many different plans is that? 565, is that right? Is that how many school districts? Yeah, I mean, and, 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 yeah, exactly. And if a school in the district could, you know, has a different situation, yeah. as well, so it's, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, definitely needed to be some modeling and uniform and, and those guidelines. Uh, Maddie, how about, how about I move to you next? I can very quickly piggyback off of what Sue just said about this. You know, part of, part of this is a collaborate, collaborative effort between management, labor, and the worker. If you see something, say something. This isn't the, the usual, I did, got short at my overtime, something like this. This is life or death now in these places. If, if there's something wrong, management can't fix it if they don't know there's a problem. Your, 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 your labor team can't get in there and fix something if they don't know there's a problem. We all have to be vigilant on the floor, you know, when we're working. Say something, speak up. Don't come to me two weeks later with a problem. <laughs> somebody could somebody could be gone by then. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll, I'll add it for you, Maddie. Document, right? Yep, document, 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 everything. And new paper, as much paper as you can hand me. When you're an the team with the most, most paper by weight usually wins. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jessica, how about I move, move to you now? So I'm going to throw some things in the chat so that people can grab them, maybe. I don't know how this works uh, on this platform. But so we've been working pretty closely with a loose coalition of organizations called the Protecting New Jersey Workers Coalition, which New Jersey Work is a part of. Um, and uh, we've been working on advocacy around a, a couple of pieces, a couple of different pieces of legislation, which have all been introduced. What I threw into the chat is a is a petition specifically for the piece of legislation around farm workers and making some of these guidelines mandated. Um, so we did that. That piece of legislation is one of the only ones that's gotten some movement because there's also some legislation written around right to refuse and protection from retaliation. Um, the farm worker legislation has moved through the Senate. Um, there's there's two bills actually. There's sort of like a carrot and a stick. <laughs> there's one that's a, about uh, appropriating five million from the CARES money to help provide reimbursements to farmers who make uh, investments in PPE and other uh, changes for social distancing. Uh, and then there's another bill that makes um, collaboration with like a, a targeted testing program and the guidelines makes them mandated. Um, so, like, ask for your support on those things. We're meeting with uh, Assemblyman Varelli this afternoon, um, who is the vice chair of the Assembly Labor Committee, because it's gone through the Senate, but it has not yet been heard in the Assembly. Um, and, and I also threw in my email address so that if folks uh, want to be in touch, either you want more information on like what we're working on or what we're doing, please. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for putting that in the chat and also mentioning that coalition. I think there's, I would say, roughly uh, probably 20 groups around the state that are working together to strengthen worker protections. And we're just, we're proud to be working with every single one of those organizations there. And Trina, I know Communities United is part of it as well. Um, and I'm going to give you um, the last word um, on closing thoughts or what, you know, what you'd want people to take away from this panel or how they can help. Uh, so that I, I will say uh, two things. So one is that stop treating workers as recipients of services. The workers are decision makers in their own health and safety. That is the problem that we are having with management and with the state sometimes. 
the workers know what they need. The workers know the resources they need. The workers know how to keep themselves safe and how to keep the people they're working with safe. Listen to them and have the resources and the money follow what their demands are. And my follow up to that is if that doesn't happen, and I can see this happening in early childhood, uh, there's going to be more direct action taken because workers are increasingly frustrated and are increasingly getting to a place where there is nothing left, left to lose. It is life or death. They are not going to kill themselves to get their paycheck. They will, however, take to the streets. And that is, that's where this is going to go unless resources begin to move toward the needs of workers. I would actually say that's the case for everything, but in, in all seriousness, during a pandemic, it is. It is a matter of their of life and death for them. So that's that's you know this is it's going to be a radicalization of, of their politics and their workplace. Um, that's my final word. So so thank you, Trina. And I think uh, you know having that the workers at the table, you know, setting the health and safety policy is just absolute key um, in this. They need a voice, and, and I'm so happy that we're ending on that note. Um, you know, because this panel, I think we did call it voices from the front line. So I really I want to thank every single one of you for participating today, getting your message out. And I would just say from the Work Environment Council, I know there's a lot of important and good work that each organization is doing so please don't hesitate to reach out to us because you know we only have power when we work together so just thank you and thank you for the work that you're doing and uh carrie i'm going to turn this back over to you thank you so much deborah that was amazing each and every panelist we learned a lot from you i'm going to now introduce sky kelty she's our postdoc at eoc and she's fabulous and she's going to tell you about our next session Hey everyone, uh, greetings from the lab here at, uh, at Rutgers. Um, next session is gonna be focused on youth and um, youth as agents of change during this COVID pandemic. Uh, we'll be highlighting uh, student leaders, young community organizers, um, and researchers like me that are under the age of 30, um, trying to work on some of this COVID um, progress, I guess. We're really trying to highlight how youth are bringing us um, into the recovery period and how we can really energize the youth instead of leaving them at home um, to play video games or, or feel um, isolated. So uh, we'll have representatives from the Liberty Science Center um, High School Internship Program, the 4-H, 4-H Youth Development Program, Surfrider Foundation, uh, Groundwork Elizabeth and uh, Newark Water Coalition. So uh, we really look forward to seeing you next week and keep an eye out for the, um, the uh, RCP links. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mike, are you, uh, are you available for closing remarks? Dr. Gotchfeld, Mike, are you available? All right, I, I don't I don't see let me see if Mike is still on really quickly. He is still on. Um and his mic is open. Dr. Gotchfeld. I don't know if I should call him. Actually, you know what? What we're gonna do is we'll um allow him to uh get in touch with you guys um and say oh he say thank you very much to everybody. Um Rob, do you wanna finish with, with some closing remarks? Sure. I, you know, so we're really looking forward to the, the next five uh, sessions. Um, and so we have sessions uh, on stress, we have sessions on transportation, another session on uh, um, case finding. And um, it's going to be, I think, uh, like this session, incorporate voices from not only the science community, uh, from Rutgers, but also you know, people on the ground who are working on uh, this problem, the, the pandemic, from all different angles. So we appreciate everybody you know, coming out uh, to be on the call today and look forward to seeing you in future weeks. Goodbye, everybody. So long. Bye now.